was quick. Good morning, everybody. Hey, welcome to Way of Hope this morning. Thanks for uh, joining us and coming out and uh, being a part of our worship this morning. It's good. And everybody here in person is really chatty. Welcome to the folks online at home this morning. It's good to have you join with us too. Um, it's a great day uh, when we can gather together and be the body of Christ and enjoy uh, fellowship together. So thank you uh, again for coming to uh, be a part of all this this morning. This morning uh, I'm going to finish out this month uh, by uh, kind of encouraging you to continue to explore your own faith journey. Um, I, I got just one point that I really want to make today, but don't get too excited. We'll be out maybe a little bit early, but not too early. Um, but uh, our gathering or centering words, see Betty's back, so they're gathering words again. Uh, no, just centering. Uh, come from First, Thess First Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, and these kind of go, uh, the last verse 22 there kind of goes along with the message this morning. And it's simply a reminder for us uh, to think about evil and stay away from it. But the scripture says, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Don't smother the Holy Spirit. Don't suffocate the Holy Spirit. And I think that's a huge problem for all of us personally and even in the church. If there's one thing that I've learned in the years that we've had Way of Hope uh, together as, as, as a church, the opportunities that we've had to allow the Holy Spirit to move and to work in our midst and not to program everything and plan everything and work minute by minute through worship every, every Sunday. If I've, if I've learned one thing, that when you give the Spirit room to work, the Spirit works. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? When you allow the Holy Spirit to kind of have some flexibility and room in your life, in your church, uh, powerful things happen that you cannot manufacture. So the scripture reminds us in Thessalonians, do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Don't suffocate Him. Don't smother Him. Don't program everything so tight that God has no room to work. And then verse 20 says, do not scoff at prophecies. But test everything that is said. You know, don't ridicule uh, what God says. Don't, don't mock God. Don't, don't, uh, don't scoff at those that have the prophetic gift of kind of seeing what's coming down the road and professing that. Um, it says to test everything that's said. Yes, we're going to run into false teachers. Yes, we're going to run into people that say things that are not particularly true. We have to discern that. But there are prophecies that come along. There are people that are, you know, inspired by God and the Holy Spirit that we should be mindful of. And then the last part here, which really hits us today, it says, hold on to what is good. Hold on to what is good. We live in a world today where a lot of good is kind of being outlawed, is being pushed aside. And the scripture says, hold on to what is good. And then it follows it up in 22 by saying, stay away from what evil? Every kind of evil. Stay away from every kind of evil. You're going to have false teachers. You're going to have false prophets. You're going to have people that preach a false gospel. And God is saying here, stay away from it. Stay away from it. And not only in the church setting. But I'm talking about in the cultural setting, too. We have people that preach culturally. This is how you should live. This is how you should act. This is what you should do. This is what you should believe. And the scripture here says that we're to stay away from every kind of evil. So we're going to touch on that today. And I'm going to press into you again a little bit today again and remind you of what God says about that very thing about dealing with evil. So pray with me this morning as we uh, give God some praise today and then uh, join me as we sing. Lord, again today, we're so thankful uh, that we can gather here to worship you uh, as the family of, of Christ, as the body of Christ, Lord, as the church. What a great privilege this is for us. And we continue to just uh, praise you for the opportunity to do it, Lord. Lord, we, we know that this past year in the pandemic has, has put some, 
some uh, pause into that and we just uh, have an, a renewed gratefulness for the opportunity here to gather and to be about your business. And we're so thankful today again, Lord, for your word that reminds us what is true, what is holy, what is righteous. Uh, it's, a, it's a roadmap on how we should live. And we're grateful that we can uh, have it, we can experience it, we can read it, we can preach it, we can live it out, Lord, because it helps us um, to know what evil is. And it helps us to stay away from every kind of evil. So today, Lord, we pray that as uh, we make our way to the message today, that uh, you'll help us to take those words and stand on them in courage. And Lord, use them to know what evil is and to fight against it, to keep away from it, to uh, just uh, um, rebel against it, Lord, in every possible way. Lord, we believe in this church that your word is truth. And we stand on that. And we're grateful that uh, you have given us this great love letter that we call the Bible. So Father, uh, guide us and help us. Open our hearts and ears today to help hear and to uh, be what you call us to be. Lord, we're grateful today for all of this. We know that there is power in your name and we lift your name high and holy. Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, we give you all praise and thanks. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Stand the same.
Have a seat this morning. The uh, last week I told you uh, after the auction that we um, we made eight hundred and fifty five dollars uh, at the auction and after recounting the money and that's always good that we always recount it several times uh, I got an update for you that it was actually eight hundred and eighty three dollars so twenty eight buck difference so God is good sometimes you know he multiplies and uh, even if it's in a mistake how we count it the first time but uh, it's all good uh, a little story to tell you about that though uh, Denise got a text on the way or after we were home and um, uh, was from Jolene and she said on the ride home uh, Walter Walter made the comment he says you know I don't think Pastor Rob knows how to round up <laughs> he says I thought he was gonna say something like twelve hundred dollars and he said two thousand dollars that's not really rounding up <laughs> but it is in church life amen and it's because of you that we can do it um, so I have a check today uh, for Phil for uh, $2,000, um, 883 of that was from the auction and 200 was for supplies that we got. We added that and then we rounded up to $2,000. So uh, thank you for your support in that. That's, so that's a little update. Uh, just a reminder that you can give securely and you can see how to do that on the screen behind me at uh, easytide.com backslash way of hope and the number there to text but you know Camp Harmony is only one thing that we give to uh, we sit in this building every Sunday um, we're grateful to be here and it's because of the graciousness of Ernie and Diane that we can be um, we do pay rent to be here um, we get a very very decent great rate to be here uh, and we're grateful for that that we can help them out and we're being helped out immensely by it, but it's because of your giving that I'm able to you know, make sure the rent gets paid too. So bear in mind that your giving continues to allow ministry to happen in lots of different ways. And we encourage you always to uh, speak with God, to talk to him about where you should be and what you should be doing with what God has already given to you. Um, we appreciate everything that comes our way, and you'll hear me say this all the time. I said it last week. It's more than just your finances. It's your time. It's your talents. Um, those things all matter in serving the kingdom of God. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, folks online, thank you as well for your continued uh, giving uh, through our online resources. We're grateful for all of that as well. So pray with me as we give God some thanks today for his goodness and grace. And then uh, come and give as the Lord lays on your heart and sing. Lord, again, uh, we are so grateful that you continue to, to meet uh, the needs that we have. Lord, some of the needs here are things that just so that we can do business week after week after week. Some of the needs that we have are to be able to support ministries around us that do great things in Jesus' name. Lord, again, we're grateful that we can help Camp Harmony along the way, but more importantly, we're grateful that we can uh, help our children, Lord, come to camp and experience the wonder in creation and just all the beauty that you have uh, designed around us, Lord. But most importantly, we are so grateful that they get to hear and to have a chance to hear uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we're grateful that Camp Harmony points to your righteousness, and we're grateful that kids show up there uh, each year uh, to hear uh, the gospel preached, to have an opportunity to find salvation so that they might live with you, Lord, forever. So, Lord, we're very, very grateful to be a part of that work, and we're thankful for each and every person who is able to give, large and small, whatever it is, Lord, we're thankful, and we ask your blessings on them. Lord, today as we give, we're grateful again, and we just thank you uh, for the opportunity. But again, well, Lord, we ask that you would uh, give us discernment in how to use it, and we pray that you would multiply it and bless it and use it, Lord, for your kingdom. Help us to always know where you're working and where you want us to be working with you. So, Lord, uh, bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you come and give, just one more note about camp. Um, yesterday they had their bike trail run uh, 
and it was good news uh, all day long. If you don't know, there is a bike trail all the way around the Queen Mahoning. It's about 17 miles. Uh, last year, they started this, uh, this trail run. I think they had, what, 30 people or something last year. Uh, this year, they had over 100. And they had teams running in, in relays. They had four different uh, loops, if you will, or four different segments where the teams could run those relays. They also had people run the whole thing, 17 miles around. It was till 5, 5.30 uh, last night. So hopefully uh, that all panned out very well for camp, but uh, things are starting to move and happen again, and we're grateful to God for that. So come and give as the Lord lays on your heart this morning. For prayer requests this morning, things that you'd like to uh, to pray about and lift up to God. It's good to see Miss Betty back from uh, Florida. I know Rod and Charlotte came back as well, so it's good that you're all back here safe. We do have some guests with us today, so please make sure that you uh, spend a little bit of time and say hi before you leave uh, with our guest today. Um, things that you'd like to pray for, lift up. How shall we pray? Go ahead, Nance. Uh, hello, 
daughter Rumble says she wants to thank everybody for their prayers. Her friend Diane is much better having wrestled with COVID. Okay. So she had COVID-19 uh, and is recovering from that. And also got a report that she was uh, able, Diane was, while she was in the hospital to witness to the neighbor next door and lead her to salvation. So praise the Lord for that too. Um, take those opportunities, every chance that you get, whenever uh, you have an opportunity to share Jesus with somebody, put on your, put on your big boy pants and do it, right? Right? Do it. It makes a big difference. So. Kathy Scott has one too. Good. Uh, prayers for my patient, Paul Lance, L-A-N-T-C, had a heart attack this morning. Okay. Want to keep Paul Lance in prayer too. A patient of Kathy who had a heart attack. Also want to keep uh, Kathy's hubby Roger in prayer too, who uh, is recovering from a heart attack. So I want to keep uh, Roger in prayer too. Uh, okay. My shorthand is not good this morning. Others, go ahead, Betty. Continue to remember Frank Young. He is, uh, went through some, uh, some surgery, and he'll find out more about his testing on Monday. So please keep him in your church. Okay, I want to keep Frank Young in prayer, who's uh, been dealing with some ongoing health issues and is recovering uh, from surgery this week. So. Others? Good, darling. I have a friend in, um, in Maryland. Her mom has been sick and acting like really weird, like out of character mm -hmm. for a couple years now. Here it comes to find out she has Lyme disease in the brain and they don't know how to treat it. The doctors don't know how to treat it. And um, let's remember her prayer. Does she have a first name, darling? I can't remember what her first name is. Okay. So it's a. a, it's a what is it? McClester. Okay. So it's a Mrs. McClester, right? Yeah. Okay. And then um, I have a truck driver that's been really um, sick for the last month back, and he has these gross things on his neck. But the other day I said to him, I thought that, he said it was from his diabetes, and I thought it was diabetic ulcers. Mm. He tells me the other day it's MRSA. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. He's driving a truck. And so, his name is up there on the, on the screen, too. He's in the hospital right now, so. Uh, where is it? Is it up there? Russ Watson is his name. Yeah, Russ Watson. Thank yes, you. Okay. We'll make the correction. But he's in the hospital now, right? Yeah, he's in the hospital. So I want to pray for Russ Watson, who has got some ulcers on the neck, and uh, they're they're infected with MRSA too. So, okay. Go ahead, Chris. David um, Chris Yanks. Uh, their family all passed away. <laughs> which no one really does right I want to keep the Barry Inks family in prayer lost a uh, family dog um, actually was sick this week and then passed away so please keep them in prayer and you've heard me say this before you know our pets so often are part of the family so it's a hard loss, especially for the, for the kids, but the parents too. Uh, so keep them in prayer. Dogs uh, hang around for quite a long time, 12, 15 years, and it's hard to let them go. So pray for Barry and the fam. Others? Go ahead, Crystal. Um, after eight years working away, Dan comes home. Wow. Yeah. Well, you better rephrase that. It sounds like Dan's been away for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Dan was uh, looking for a new job and got two offers, one which he's going to accept. Um, so that's answered prayer, right? He'll be home every night, which is what he wants. You wait till your kids figure, your, your, your daughter figures that out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you this, I told it to you before. When I came off the road after, I don't know, 15 years, Jennifer was what, about six, seven, eight? 11, yeah, maybe 11, 12, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember, it's a long time ago. Lost time. Lost time. Yeah, she was, it would have been uh, 1992. So she was about 
what? Yeah, no, she's about eight, nine. And uh, she looked at me after I was home about two weeks, and she said, are you ever going to go back to work? <laughs> Our relationship since then. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a little bit of change for you too, because I know it was difficult for Denise back then too, because I was gone all the time, and then now I'm home. So, but that's a good thing. I'm glad that I'm home and have been. Any others? Let me share mine with you. I'm gonna keep my uh, friend Steve, my childhood friend Steve in prayer, who's still recovering from uh, colon surgery. Did get a good report. Uh, doesn't have to go back and see the doctor until October. Uh, he was back at work, I understand, so continue to pray for recovery for him. Uh, and also his wife Leslie, who is uh, dealing with him and taking care of him. Uh, I want to keep David Bailey in prayer. Uh, this came from Mary Taylor last week. Uh, but again, I want to lift him up because uh, he fell off a ladder and broke both of his legs. So I want to keep him, him in prayer for healing for that. Again, praise that Dan's finding a new job and, and has two offers. I want to keep Steve Kozak in prayer, who's also looking for a new job. Um, yet to find one, but pray that he does as well. I uh, also want to keep, this comes from Jeannie Norris, um, a friend of hers, uh, grandmother named Eileen Reha. Um, dear woman was 86 years old. Uh, Jeannie said she came home, not this past Friday, the Friday before, and uh, she uh, parked her car in the garage and she started to head up the garage steps to the upstairs, I guess, and actually fell back down the stairs and broke her neck in two places. Um, they didn't find the dear woman until Saturday morning. Um, they believe that she had a heart attack. She was um, in serious intensive care all week and passed away this past Friday the 24th. So please keep the Reha family in prayer, Jeannie in prayer. Um, what, a, what, a, what a tragic story. So. I'll just lift them up for some comfort and some, some, some blessings and grace. Also, uh, Betty shared this with me earlier in the week too, and then I got an update today on John Unger. Uh, many of you know John. Uh, he was one of the, the uh, miners that was trapped in the, in, uh, the mine some years back. So I uh, want to lift him up in prayer. He fell off his tractor, um, has a serious leg wound. I just heard this morning that his leg is actually broken in two places. Um, he needs some, some pretty serious surgery. They've done a few little surgeries already, uh, drained it and took out a blood clot, but they're waiting for the swelling to go down so that they can go in and do um, more of a surgery or the, finish the surgery on him. So please keep John in prayer. Uh, you may know that his uh, wife Sue is also handicapped uh, pretty seriously as well, so they're, they're kind of up against it now, I think, as far as... Uh, caring for each other so uh, please keep them both in prayer John and Sue. I uh, want to keep uh, Tom's friend uh, Jim Mills in prayer who had heart surgery this week and I'm hopeful is recovering and okay so he's on the mend but he's got some pain. I uh, also want to keep uh, Kathy Frederick in prayer. I did see Jim here somewhere. I want to keep Kathy in prayer. I didn't know whether she came with you or not. I didn't see her. So she was uh, hospitalized this week and diagnosed with colitis and uh, dealing with some serious pain and some bleeding issues. But I want to keep her in prayer. I want to keep Jim in prayer as well because he's still recovering from the uh, shoulder surgery that he had some weeks back. So prayers for both of them. Also want to keep the Ruth Ott family in prayer. They are neighbors here or were neighbors here. Where'd they move to, Ernie and Diane? Do you remember? Do you know? Indian Lake. Indian Lake. Did they move out to the, the place at Indian Lake? Okay. Um, they actually were neighbors here. If you look back out through the window over there and around the corner a little bit is where they were, Ruth and Marla Knott. Uh, Ruth passed away uh, this week, so please keep uh, that family in prayer, the Ott family. Marlon, her husband particularly, uh, in her passing. And I think that covers it for me. Anybody else? No? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer then and lift up your prayer requests to God. 
Um, give him some praise and thanks because he is worthy of that. And then uh, I will close us in prayer and we'll make our way to the message this morning. So join us, uh, join me as we pray. Lord, this morning as we uh, pause here to just uh, be able to have some conversation with you in prayer, we want to thank you again, Lord, for uh, just your word that helps protect us from evil. As we think around our, our world today, our nation today, we know that, that evil is all around us. And we know, Lord, that we oftentimes become associated with it, sometimes by our own choices, sometimes we're simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. But Lord, today we pray that as Christians, that you'll give us the courage and strength and the power that we need to first and foremost identify those things, Lord, that rebel against you, that are sinful, that are evil, to recognize them to recognize them in our own lives and do something about them and weed them out and work, Lord, to uh, just live a holy life and a righteous life. Lord, we know that evil can consume us and we pray for your protection against it and we pray that you would reveal it to us when we're kind of blinded. Help us to see it, Lord, and help us to take action against it. Lord, today, uh, as we come to the message, you have some, some strong words for us when we delve into evil and we ignore your words and we're rebellious against you. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, just open our hearts and minds uh, to hear these words. Today, again, Lord, we pray for uh, our prayer list. We thank you that uh, we have the ability to pray and the opportunity to pray. We thank you that we can lift up our own requests and the requests of our neighbors and friends and people that we're concerned about. We're thankful, Lord, that you uh, hear these requests and that you move in power to bring healing and help and grace and, and uh, just hear the praises here. So over this list again, Lord, we ask for your blessings and goodness and grace. We ask for healing power and, and just uh, for a movement, Lord, that uh, is uh, according to your will in each and every case. Lord, today we're grateful that uh, we have these opportunities to speak about these things and lift them up to you. And we thank you that you hear them. Lord, guide us now as we uh, make our way to the message. Help us, anoint us with your Holy Spirit and guide us as we preach and as we pray and as we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, title of today's message is uh, Morality Upside Down. Morality Upside Down from uh, one verse, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Um, as we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks, we have uh, been looking at 10 sins that Christians need to deal with in their lives. And I'm grateful uh, for, for several positive comments about the messages that I've received, both in person, online, 
Um, it's made some people think. Thank you for that. I appreciate the encouragement. Um, as I often say, you know, every week is kind of a book report. You got to build a sermon and preach. And uh, some days are easier than other days. So I'm grateful uh, for the encouragement. This message was a little harder to come by. Um, I had to squeeze it out, I guess, but we'll see how it goes. But the last two weeks have really made a lot of people think a little deeper about their own faith journey. And part of being a Christian, I believe, is, again, doing some self-inventory and looking at where, you know, we're, we're being rebellious against God. Uh, sometimes it's, it just happens and we don't pay any attention to it, but we should. Now, today I want to pose another question to you more as the church, not so much individually as the Christian, but more as the church. And it should also invite some deep reflection into the depth of our faith. I mean, that's been my intent over the last few weeks. It's been to get us to really take an honest look at ourselves and where we position ourselves when it comes to a biblical worldview on things. Uh, we're Christians. We're to have a biblical worldview of things. The truth is, is that we can really align ourselves and play nice uh, with all the current worldviews that are going on. We can ignore them. We can just accept them. We can, we can play nice. But the issue really here is, is that none of that is going to get us to heaven. Playing nice with the world doesn't get you to eternal life. Only believing that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and then following and living out the scripture to the best of our abilities is going to point us to heaven bound. Um, I think much of the problem that we have today in society is the church is a muddied up mess. It's a muddled up mess. It doesn't know where it stands or what it believes. And it just kind of sways with the social and political winds of the day. Um, the Bible is pretty black and white in a lot of things. And there's not a lot of room to kind of sway and just follow the wind. I think as the church at large, we've kind of lost our bearings and our true purpose. I mean, the church exists to influence people towards righteousness and holy living. That's our job. That's what Jesus established the church for, to influence people towards righteousness and holy living. We are here to reach people for Jesus Christ. And we do that by pointing them to his righteousness, not our own. And then we discipline them, we disciple them to maturity in Jesus Christ. I mean, if you look back in our history, long before the separation of church and state that we hear the world preach, the church was tough. The pulpit was tough on, on, on how we lived, how we lived as a culture, who we called as leaders. And somehow we've outlawed all that. I'm not sure that was a good thing. If we're ever going to have an impact in our nation or the world for that matter, we have to stand on the truth of God's word and we have to speak out. Being a silent Christian doesn't, doesn't solve anything, doesn't do anything. And believe me, I'm not one of these guys that are, you know, an activist. I'm not encouraging you to go out and protest in the street. But there are places that we need to speak out. There are places that we need to vote our Christian conscience. There are places that we need to win people for Jesus. To do anything else is merely unbelief. To not follow what Jesus says is simply unbelief. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago exactly. We said that believing God is absolutely vital to our growing and maturing as Christians. We really can't cherry pick what the scripture says. We can't say, well, I believe this, but I don't believe that. And I've been in lots of discussions over the years where talking with Christian people and pastoral conferences, devout people that 
Don't claim the scripture as inerrant and from God. I had a conversation one time with a lady in Kansas about Jesus being king of kings and lord of lords. She said, Jesus ain't my king. We were in a pastoral conference. I said, what do you mean? Well, that's military language. My Jesus is not a military. That's, that, no, he's not the king. And it's like, you know, scripture says he's coming one day. And he's coming with an army. And he's going to make things right. So we have to believe what the scripture says. Jesus said one of the main reasons that we don't see his wonder working power is because of our unbelief. Jesus answered his disciples in Matthew 17 and verse 20. They were asking why they couldn't cast out demons. And he says, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Do you hear what that says? Unbelief is believing something other than what God has said about a situation. I said this a few weeks ago. You can believe Jesus was raised from the dead. You can believe he's your Lord. You can believe he's coming soon. But if you don't believe and do what he says, you're operating in unbelief. You can believe in him, but still not believe what he says. The Bible calls that an evil heart, a hardened heart. And a heart of unbelief grieves God. I believe that much of the reason that the church has lost its influence in society is because Christians don't believe God's word is truth. It's a terrible thing to say. But I think it's true. I've said this many times. We have a decision to make after reading the first five words of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. You have a decision to make after you read these five words. In the beginning, God created. You have to decide right then and there. Are those five words true? We have to determine whether this is truth or not. And if it is, then everything that follows those five words are true too. And if they're not truth, then everything that follows is a waste of your time. You have to make a decision. If the church is going to influence our world for Jesus Christ, we have to stand on the truth of God's word and speak out. Evolution is a theory. A theory that no one's ever been able to connect the dots to. And I'll tell you straight up front, I'm a moron. But I find it far easier to believe that God created everything than it is to say that we slimed up out of some amoeba somewhere and we got all of this wonderful ability the cell phone that you're carrying was created by somebody it just didn't happen it didn't evolve it has a creator and you have more technology in you than your cell phone does how can you not believe that you don't have a creator now here's the rub if you really speak truth to people, God's truth, you probably are going to become more and more unpopular. Just goes with the territory. I mean, look what they did to Jesus, right? So here's the question for us today. If the church doesn't stand up for morality, 
and speak out against immorality, who will? If the church doesn't stand up for morality and speak out against immorality, who will? The government? Big corporations? I know, Hollywood, right? What I'm talking about here is morals and ethics and standards, principles of honesty, integrity, honor, virtue, goodness, and decency. Who will stand up for those things if the church doesn't? In this silly, ridiculously crazy world that we live in today, we have people who want to outlaw soda and legalize marijuana. We're living in a world right now where there's certain Dr. Seuss books that are just too evil to be sold to anybody. They're just too much for people. They can't, they can't handle it. We can't sell them anymore. And yet, we are to applaud the sinful sexual degradation of two women simulating sex together on the Grammys while singing vulgar lyrics. And we're to think of that as empowerment. We're supposed to see it as something virtuous. And to do otherwise, we're supposed to applaud, to, 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 to applaud that. To do otherwise would make someone call me a misogynist and a racist for speaking out against powerful, strong black women. Or I'm one of those pearl-clutching religious conservatives freaking out. Today, I have only one point to share. And here it is from Isaiah chapter 5, and verse 20. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now, it's extremely important this morning that we understand the gravity of this verse. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Now, this verse is intended for everybody. But it is, it is specifically pointed towards God's people. It's pointed to Christians. I want to encourage you to go back and read Isaiah chapter 5. It's a fascinating chapter. Do it in your devotions this week. It talks about God planting a vineyard. It talks about God using every possible good resource to plant this vineyard. And the vineyard is, is his people. It's Israel. It's Jerusalem. And he does everything perfectly in this vineyard. And he awaits the harvest, the fruit. And the fruit is bad. Now, if you're a gardener or a farmer, what do you do when the field, the crop turns bad? What do you do? You plow it down, right? Well, you read Isaiah 5 and see what God does to his people. Because he plows it down. He destroys it. And we need to be serious about this stuff. What we're talking about here is those who reverse right and wrong. Those who pervert what is good and manipulate the truth. That's what Isaiah 5 is talking about. And you know, as a country, as a, as a nation, we've been doing that for a long time. Reversing right and wrong, perverting what is good and manipulating the truth. If you go back in our history in 1962, we outlawed 
in school prayer. <coughs> prayer. We outlawed prayer. Something that was good. Something that, that was intended to remind people that there was something higher. There was a higher power that they would one day answer to. Prayer in school was designed to kind of help combat juvenile delinquency. And now all of a sudden it was bad. You know, for 200 years, it was a common practice for public schools to open with an oral prayer or Bible reading. 200 years. And then by the stroke of a pen, it was illegal. It was bad. Have a conversation today with somebody about prayer in school. <laughs> Pretty much everybody will tell you, oh, that's bad, that's bad, that's bad. Yeah, it can be, I guess. Wrong people are involved. But it's really not bad to talk about Jesus, is it? And what have we reaped from this decision? More single parent families more street violence, more juvenile delinquency, not less. And we have churches that are dying. In 1962, started the outlaw of prayer in school. You know when church attendance started to decline in this nation? I've done a lot of timelines on attendance in different churches. In 1962 is when the church decline started, and it's been happening ever since. In the 70s, the opposite is true. Abortion became legal. The destruction of human life, something bad, now became the law. It became good. Now, what did we do in making this decision? Well, we redefined the value of life as the right to kill an unborn child. And what did we get from this decision? Well, we have devalued life. We render the unborn and children and the elderly and the infirm as insignificant, unnecessary, and a burden on society. And worse yet, many today have no value of any human life. Do you know what I'm saying? There are people walking around in this world right now that have no value of any human life not even their own. Ten days ago, a 26-year-old boy from this community killed a woman over a refrigerator. Really? Over a refrigerator? And this is only the tip of the iceberg in America today. We call drunkenness a good time and good fellowship. Greed's getting what we deserve. Foul language is just the way that we express ourselves. Extravagance is being open-minded. Fornication, you know what I'm talking about? It's just a great, healthy, overwhelmingly positive choice. And adultery is just two fellow creatures enjoying each other. You know, the moral code has been written by God. But now, personal taste rules supreme. The world is working and taking paganism and hedonism and idolatry and sexual degradation and it's defining them as virtuous and moral. That's what it means to call evil good and good evil. 
Romans 1, starting at verse 20, says, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Do you hear that? There's no excuse for not knowing God. Verse 21, yes, they knew God, <clears throat> but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. 24. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That's a huge problem in today's world too, you know. We worship the creation instead of the creator. Verse 26, that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. <clears throat> Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Sound familiar? Sound like a world that we might be living in? What we're witnessing in America today is the redefining of evil and good. And I want you to know that that's one of the characteristics of the end times, you know. When we start saying that evil things are good and good things are evil, we are knowingly and willingly turning our values and norms upside down. We're trying to reverse everything that God has said. What God calls evil, society calls good, and vice versa. It is the foolish reversal of things by man without God. And Proverbs 17 and 15 says the Lord detests it. The Living Bible says the Lord despises those who say that bad is good and good is bad. The New Living says acquitting the guilty and condemning the innocent. Both are detestable to the Lord. Isaiah 5 and 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I want you to look at that word woe for a minute. If you got horses, you probably use that to tell the horse to stop, right? It's not exactly what it means here. Woe is a pronouncement of judgment. 
It's judgment on those that permit certain actions on the basis of pleasure, those that pervert what is good and reverse right and wrong and define sin with new definitions and refuse to accept the standard of God's revelation. Woe is a word of judgment. The word woe means misfortune and calamity and disaster and trouble and misery and affliction and grief on all those who call evil good and good evil. Listen to me carefully. There is no middle ground that we as Christians can have with the world. There is no peace with the world. There is no compromise. Why? Because the world has redefined what being good is. They've redefined what evil is. The truth is, is that now we're celebrating our rules as the new sovereign power in American life instead of following God's rules. We live in a post-modern society, a post-Christian society. We're celebrating our rules now instead of following God rules. And there is no compromising with that. First John 5 and 19 says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. There's no compromising with that. Now the problem is the world actually believes that their way is more virtuous, more loving, more equal than God's way. There's no compromise with that. There's no middle ground with that. How can the world say that they're more loving and more equal than God? And right now, particularly, the world is trying to treat committed believers as dangerous radicals. And they're trying to turn truth on its head. You know, right now in Congress, there's a bill already passed by the House of Representatives twice that could make us all criminals. It's called the Equality Act or H.R. 5. And if it gets full passage... It will make it illegal to speak out against the ungodly issues regarding sexuality and gender. It is definitely a bill that would call evil good. Franklin Graham shared a few points about the bill if it becomes law in a recent letter. And this is what he writes. And you can go and check this out at... uh, the American Defense Fund, or wherever you would like to, uh, you can Google it and find it pretty quickly about what the Equality Act is really all about. You can actually Google it and bring up the bill online and read the bill yourself. But here's what Franklin Graham writes. He says, the Equality Act designates schools, churches, and healthcare organizations as public accommodations. With this, schools, churches, and hospitals could be forced to accept the government's beliefs and mandates about sexual orientation and gender identity. That would be highly intrusive and incredibly far-reaching. It will threaten everyday speech where people can be fined or lose their jobs for using the wrong name or pronouns. The Equality Act will legislate that we will allow boys and girls sports, boys and girls locker rooms, men in women's shelters, and men in women's prisons. It will force teachers and students to publicly pretend that a biological male is a female. Schools will be encouraged or mandated to to instruct first, second, and third graders that they can choose to be a boy or a girl or neither or both making biological sex and science a relic of the past. The Equality Act will use the force of law across all 50 states 
to strip Christian and other religious ministries of their right to hire people of shared faith to pursue a shared mission. Can you imagine a Christian organization being forced to hire people hostile to its deeply held beliefs and have no passion for its beliefs, teachings, and mission? That doesn't work. The Equality Act will strip health professionals of their rights of conscience. It will force doctors and medical professionals who long to do no harm to engage in gender transition treatments such as hormone blocking, cross-sex hormones, or surgery. It is obvious that a Catholic or faith-based hospital should not have to perform gender transition surgeries that go entirely against all that they believe. The Equality Act will be a tool used by the government to deny or threaten accreditation to religious colleges and universities if they do not satisfy the demands of the secular left to apply sexual orientation and gender identity to dorms, sports, uh, places of privacy, and even teachings. The act could be used as a weapon to threaten the availability of federal student loans and grants to students at certain disfavored religious schools. These are just a few examples, friends. This is a pivotal time for our nation. The impact of this legislation is immense. We must not remain silent and accept what we know is wrong. Franklin Graham. Now let me wrap up by saying this. Those who are passing this law will face serious judgment from our righteous God. But those who go along with this law are just as guilty. Isaiah 5 and 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We must stand firm in the righteousness of God. We cannot call evil good, nor can we call wrong right. Yes, we may have to answer in the court of law, in the court of men, for not doing so in this world, but I can assure you that is much more desirable than standing before God and trying to explain to Him why you went along with all this stuff. Listen carefully to me. Society wants you to applaud immorality. It wants you to applaud what happened at the Grammys a few weeks ago. A society that is forced to applaud immorality and call it morality, that is a society that is going to bring the judgment of God. That is a society that's just asking for the judgment of God. And if you don't believe that God will plow us under, go back and read Isaiah chapter 5. So what's the cure? Ephesians 5 and 11 says, Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. That's what we're trying to do today. The cure is to continue to proclaim the name of Jesus without compromise. How do you extinguish darkness? You turn on the light, right? That's how you make the darkness go away. John 3 and 19 says this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for the fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. The church, we are the keepers of the truth and the light. If we don't call out immorality, who will? We are the keepers of truth and the light. I encourage you, don't be stingy with it. Don't keep it silent. Don't give up. Don't despair. Don't grow weary from doing right. 
And above all, do not condone sinful behavior. Isaiah 5 and 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Don't believe that God doesn't care about this stuff. Because I don't believe that God wants to fool around with this stuff. He certainly will plow us under if we decide to just simply go our own way and observe our own law. Don't be fooled. Don't be led astray. Stand fast on God's word. Amen? Let's stand and sing. on the screen right there. Lord, I love you. Please help me to trust 
and obey. Let that be the last word as we leave here today. And let that be your heart that uh, you live life for Jesus. Lord, I love you. Please help me to trust and obey. Anything we need to know before we go? Uh, fellowship Quartet will be at Wimber Church of the Brethren next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Okay, Wimber Church of the Brethren, Fellowship Quartet, 6 o'clock. I did see a flyer pass over my desk for that too, by the way. Should have said something too about it. So if you're interested, 6 o'clock, Wimber Church of the Brethren is right on Main Street in Wimber. You can't miss it, so... Anything else? Go now in the righteousness of faith and live by God's just demands. Let nothing claim your devotion above the Lord and count nothing of value above knowing Christ. Press on towards the ultimate prize of being one with Him. And may God's perfect word revive your soul. May Christ Jesus be your Savior and your rock. And may the Holy Spirit strengthen you to press ever onward. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Have a great week everybody. Thanks for joining us online. God's blessings to you. We'll see you all back here 10 a.m. next Sunday. God's blessings.